um, French agricultural minister already uh, mentioned uh, mirror clauses as one of the uh, priorities uh, for the uh, French EU uh, presidency. Uh, this uh, scheme uh, will uh, only allow to import uh, agricultural products uh, that comply uh, with the uh, restrictive uh, production conditions uh, for uh, European productions. Uh, within the uh, European Commission, uh, DG uh, Trade uh, is uh, supporting more the uh, CBAM or Carbon Border Adjustment uh, Mechanism in order to have it uh, accepted uh, by the uh, WTO multilateral bodies. Uh, the uh, European uh, trade policy is therefore uh, prioritizing uh, climate change and mitigation over biodiversity protection. The EU is uh, offering an action plan through its uh, Green Deal and strategies such as uh, Farm to Fork uh, or uh, the uh, EU's uh, biodiversity strategy for 2030. So is it a, a credible and a feasible uh, strategy? Maud Le Lièvre, I will start with you. Good morning. You are the uh, chair of uh, the uh, French Committee for IUCN and also a member of the International Council of IUCN. You are a general uh, delegate for ECOMEOS and uh, you created uh, the National Conference uh, on Biodiversity. And uh, it was uh, its uh, 11th edition that was uh, organized in October 2020. In Marseille, recently, uh, the IUCN World Conservation Congress was held, uh, say, uh, bringing together um, global representatives. What is your opinion on this? Thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, we are moving forward, making progress on uh, these topics. And this is uh, related uh, not only to agriculture, but also uh, international standards uh, and also uh, what we uh, consume and produce uh, uh, is something that is very important to IUCN. And I'm probably uh, more sensitive to this uh, than others uh, as a, a daughter and granddaughter of uh, farmers. So, as I said, we're making progress on these rules. Uh, the rules of international trade uh, are uh, governed uh, by uh, free trade, uh, so there is a uh, uh, little focus on uh, the management of the uh, current climate crisis. Uh, and uh, our economic model is still unsustainable uh, from an agricultural point of view. And uh, we are uh, arguing for a change of paradigm. And uh, we have uh, several uh, examples in mind, for instance, uh, cotton production uh, with, uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, French uh, cotton producers that uh, use uh, uh, a lot of uh, pesticides and uh, that are contributing to deforestation and the loss of uh, food crops. Uh, and so we need to make sure that our models are balanced. So uh, today uh, we are not uh, taking into account uh, these uh, climate challenges enough. And uh, uh, we have intensive uh, farming uh, uh, um, countries uh, that are exporting uh, to the EU. And uh, there's a lot of uh, good intentions uh, uh, through uh, the use uh, of a GMO or plant uh, protection uh, products uh, uh, that are forbidden in the EU uh, or the use of uh, antibiotics. Uh, for instance, uh, we can see uh, that uh, in Africa, for instance, uh, 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 puberty, uh, early puberty is uh, on the rise uh, uh, due to these uh, to the uh, growth uh, boosters uh, that I have been using in uh, agricultural production. So uh, we are a, a major uh, player internationally. And uh, so uh, we need uh, to uh, focus on uh, uh, climate change uh, mitigation and biodiversity protection. And uh, we need uh, so to uh, focus on the uh, European Green Deal. And we need uh, to uh, fight against uh, these challenges, including deforestation uh, in uh, southern countries. Uh, uh, there are some uh, international uh, commitments uh, that were taken, and uh, including uh, the um, uh, mirror clauses. This was announced uh, by uh, the uh, French uh, president 
at the IUCN World Conservation Congress at the end of August in Marseille. Uh, these uh, were commitments uh, that were taken uh, as part of the uh, trade uh, policy for the EU. And uh, it's also about inclusion. Uh, we needed to make sure uh, that we uh, include a sustainable food system, so which is uh, not necessarily included in future agreements. Uh, uh, we will uh, be paying close attention uh, to uh, the uh, Paris Agreement uh, uh, and uh, the uh, COP26 uh, conclusions. Uh, and uh, there's a uh, study that have been uh, carried out on the uh, feasibility of uh, mirror clauses. Uh, and uh, there will also be a report um, released in June 2022 on animal welfare. Deforestation is um, an essential uh, topic for IUCN. Some conclusions uh, were presented in November. Um, just to give you a few figures, uh, uh, the EU is uh, the second biggest importer uh, in the uh, world, uh, uh, just uh, after China, uh, importing 13% uh, of uh, products uh, uh, coming from deforestation. and. Uh, in uh, France, uh, since uh, 1990, we lost uh, uh, 420 million hectares of forests. Uh, and so, uh, regarding what uh, the what the previous uh, speaker said, uh, this uh, um, aggravated uh, the uh, biodiversity and climate crisis. So, these uh, are some uh, resolutions uh, that uh, uh, we adopted at the level of the uh, Global Congress. Uh, we adopted 137 uh, political motions uh, to make sure that uh, uh, all um, uh, signatory uh, countries uh, can adopt these. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to uh, give the floor to Iliana Axiotiades. Uh, you are the uh, Secretary uh, General of Coserol, an association that represents uh, traders uh, in uh, food, uh, uh, agricultural commodities and, uh, and uh, agro supply of uh, Euromalt, um, which uh, uh, re represents uh, the European industry of malting and Unistock. Uh, could you share uh, your uh, reflections on this topic? I think that uh, uh, intention is key. Uh, we need to fight uh, climate change. We need to improve environmental protection. But uh, I'm fearing that we are going too fast. Uh, this morning, uh, we uh, heard uh, that the uh, priority of the uh, French uh, EU presidency is uh, mirror clauses. So we have the feeling that we need to move forward. I understand. Uh, uh, what uh, what was said, uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, um, produce everything that we uh, cannot uh, import. And on top of that, there's agricultural trade that has an impact on the economy, a huge impact. It also has an impact on uh, food security in France and in the EU. We've talked about it a lot, uh, but uh, um, from the outside, um, people think that we will never lack food in Europe, uh, but I think that uh, we can have a, a few bad harvests uh, due to climate change, so there is a risk. So we need to change the way we carry out trade. We need to uh, change standards, but at global level, not just European level. And uh, I think that uh, res rather than uh, making this approach uh, mandatory, I think that uh, we need to uh, support this change. We need uh, to assess uh, the impact that uh, this approach will have on agricultural trade, uh, on the economy, on the agri-food industry as well, because uh, we import uh, products uh, to process them and then uh, re-export them. So, um, um, in that respect, uh, the uh, trade balance is uh, particularly important. And it also uh, has an impact on the geopolitical uh, position in Europe. Uh, because uh, if uh, we have a disagreement uh, with our partners on agriculture, it can have an impact uh, on uh, other sectors as well. If Europe, moreover, 
is no longer a significant player globally. Uh, we will lose some of our global influence. What Putin did with gas supply, uh, well, he could do uh, the same with food. Uh, Ukraine could too. So um, it's all intertwined. I think that these are uh, incredibly uh, complex issues, and we should uh, be wary of a, a solution that seems too straightforward. We need to have a look at uh, 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 agricultural trade, why we need it, how much uh, uh, it generates. Uh, we need to have a look at our uh, trade balance. And uh, European farmers uh, need uh, to get some tools. Uh, uh, we talked about farm to fork. I know I'm mixing up everything, but it's all linked. Coseral uh, carried out a, an impact survey. Uh, that showed uh, that uh, in the best case scenario, uh, Europe could become an importer, but we need to remain an exporter as well. Uh, we need a significant level of production in Europe. And this morning, we talked about volumes as well. And at Coseral, uh, we know that it's important to reach a high level of production in Europe. And uh, on top of that, uh, we uh, are being told that we need to uh, to cut by 50% uh, the uh, pesticides that we use, etc. So we need to uh, provide uh, uh, farmers with the necessary tools. There are many things happening right now. And I think that uh, we need to uh, move forward faster. We need to make progress faster. You mentioned uh, the great number of startups uh, that are developing technologies that could be v available very quickly uh, for automation, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence. There are many things happening. Uh, you need seeds uh, that uh, will enable you to use uh, less water uh, to uh, resist uh, extreme temperature. And on top of that, I think that uh, we need to initiate discussions uh, that are informal with various uh, EU countries, but also third countries. And this way, uh, we could uh, change standards globally. Uh, there's a, an initiative at the level of the United Nations uh, on the overhaul of our food systems. Uh, it, it, we, it, we're making slow progress, uh, just like we did uh, with uh, COP26. Uh, but uh, uh, please do not try and solve everything uh, during the French presidency. I just have a few words to add about deforestation, but I don't want to uh, speak for too long. Yes, we will come back to that later. So if I uh, summarize what you said, uh, we need to get some perspective. We need uh, to improve standards globally. So I'm not saying we should not do uh, anything about it, but we, we should discuss it and organize it in the long term. Now I would like to give the floor to Arnold uh, Persh alisak You are a farmer in uh, Seine-Maritime, Normandy. You're a member of the Board of Directors in charge of International Affairs and Vice President of the Food Chain Committee at FNSEA. Your federation is very vocal on that subject. Uh, what can you tell us about this? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, to uh, Singjeta, uh, um, HGBB, and uh, to the uh, Forum for the Future of Agriculture for inviting me. Well, mirror clauses. Uh, our uh, federation, FNSAA, uh, has been an advocate uh, for this uh, for many years. So we're very happy to see that this has become a priority. Uh, with uh, Brexit, uh, uh, we saw the importance of a level playing field of uh, a fair competition. And uh, to uh, keep uh, uh, the uh, same standards as much as possible. When we are negotiating with major countries uh, uh, such as uh, Canada, Nakosu countries, or Australia, New Zealand, uh, so we're really talking about heavyweights in terms of um, agriculture. And so it's very important that we produce uh, with uh, standards that are as close as possible. Uh, for instance, uh, the uh, vote on CETA was uh, very controversial at uh, the uh, in the French uh, Parliament, uh, 
And that was uh, because uh, there were uh, very different standards in uh, Canada and the EU. Uh, for instance, uh, with the 46 pesticides used in Canada that are banned in the EU and that far uh, European farmers would love to be allowed to use. Uh, because if uh, uh, these uh, uh, pesticides are um, harmless, we should be able to use them. But we need to have uh, similar standards. And I think this is uh, what drove the French government to understand that we need to move forward uh, because the agricultural industry is no longer ready uh, to uh, accept um, anything. Uh, for instance, with uh, Mercosur, uh, there are uh, 51 uh, plant pr protection products uh, that are used that are banned uh, in the EU including 25 uh, that uh, have been deemed uh, harmful. Well, you, you see that we need to move forward. And there is something positive that should be our very first step of action. In uh, the agreement uh, between the Council, the European Council, the European Commission and the Parliament uh, that uh, was signed in uh, July, well, the European Commission uh, committed uh, to commission uh, an impact survey in order to amend uh, the WTO uh, rules uh, to be allowed to implement these uh, mirror clauses. So even though um, uh, DG Trade uh, is uh, reluctant to, to do this uh, uh, because uh, agriculture was often a way of uh, signing agreements with other countries, at the same time, uh, DG Trade is one of the uh, DGs in the Commission, and uh, we always need to find some uh, political meaning in that. So uh, the uh, uh, Council uh, should have a say, and uh, so does uh, the European Parliament. So it might explain why uh, we have a more balanced approach. And uh, in France, uh, we often um, believe uh, in a great saviour, but uh, I think that the importance of our parliament is maybe more limited here. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to uh, turn uh, to uh, Mathieu Brun. Uh, you are in charge of uh, studies uh, and uh, partner, uh, academic partnerships at Club uh, Demeter. You are an associate uh, researcher at uh, the uh, Political Science Institute in Bordeaux. You developed an expertise on uh, geopolitical issues uh, on agriculture, uh, rural life, and uh, uh, food at a global level, and uh, focusing more specifically on the Arab world and Africa. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to uh, take part in this uh, roundtable. So I'm just going to start by sharing a few ideas, and I can come back to that later. There are some uh, uh, paradoxes, some uh, 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 questions arising from this uh, discussion. And uh, we also uh, try to and be uh, prospective with our uh, members uh, and uh, in our yearly uh, publications. So I think that it's important to, to uh, repeat the same things uh, several times. And even though we're talking increasingly about a, a sustain sustainable uh, agriculture, well, um, the uh, European agricultural system is one of the most uh, sustainable in the world uh, based on uh, FAO uh, assessments, for instance. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, poultry uh, production in terms of uh, GES emissions uh, is uh, at a very low level, uh, much lower than anywhere else in the world. So uh, I think it's important um, to, uh, re to recall this. And uh, I think that uh, consumers uh, now have uh, three um, fundamental expectations. And uh, um, it's important to uh, eat well, uh, to age well. And uh, there's also an expectation in terms of uh, sustainability uh, from an economic, uh, environmental, but also social point of view. So uh, we have the impression uh, that uh, the uh, uh, world uh, that is uh, um, opening to us uh, is uh, uh, about degrowth, de-globalization, 
and uh, the risk of uh, the union. Uh, we talked about uh, the uh, national plans for agriculture, for instance, this morning, Brexit, etc. So uh, now I'd like to go back to that uh, contradiction between food security and food sovereignty. I think that it's uh, related uh, to uh, the uh, standards uh, on uh, sustainability. Can we uh, remain open in a world that is uh, uh, closing down? Over the uh, past uh, few uh, months, uh, in that context of a pandemic, and uh, with this uh, willingness uh, to uh, gain back uh, food sovereignty, well, uh, can we do that uh, if it is uh, detrimental to others? And uh, uh, this goes back to uh, what Eliana said about uh, the interconnection of markets and food systems today. If we uh, think about uh, the sustainability of our food system, we cannot do it on our own um, in isolation uh, because uh, there's a, a, a trade of goods. Uh, for instance, uh, you're drinking coffee, and I doubt uh, that it is uh, produced uh, uh, 25 kilometers away from here. So. Uh, uh, food commodities are traded, and it has always been the case. So all of this is interconnected. Second point, I think that it's important to look at pol uh, geopolitical issues as well. You mentioned uh, the impact of uh, European policies on the ability to uh, set prices. But we should also uh, talk about uh, the ability of uh, France and the EU uh, of uh, being a, a geopolitical player. Because this is a, a geopolitical weapon, and I hope we can come back to this later. So if uh, we have a, a decline in production in Europe, what impact will it have uh, on the, the European market, but also on global markets, on our uh, trade partners and on uh, global food security? Uh, demand is uh, on the rise. Uh, this is what we can see in uh, China and in other uh, country, uh, countries uh, with a greater uh, population growth. It will be the case also in Africa. There are more and more people to feed. So uh, ca can we uh, focus as well uh, on food security? If in the future, uh, Europe cannot contribute to, to the balance of uh, global food systems, then uh, Brazil, the United States, or Russia might uh, take up that role. So it means uh, that also our importers will uh, buy more elsewhere. So I really wanted to uh, touch on geopolit geopolitics, and because I think that uh, this is a very interesting approach. But does the EU have the power to impose uh, that uh, vision of sustainability to its uh, partners? So at a time when uh, we need uh, to um, uh, claim our power in uh, this environment uh, of uh, uh, great c um, competition, uh, uh, is it uh, the right thing to do? European institutions are very good at uh, creating standards, uh, but uh, how can we have an impact on uh, the uh, standards uh, in other countries as well um, for our uh, trade partners? And uh, I talked about uh, power. I talked about Brazil, uh, China, the United States, uh, about France as well, and uh, agricultural powers. But at the moment, uh, the uh, greatest uh, power is the consumers. So uh, we have uh, that willingness uh, to be more sustainable. But what about consumers? So uh, the objective is not to be just in interdependent without cooperating. So in a world uh, where we're going to uh, buy uh, food at a price uh, that is always increasing, what is uh, the expectation of uh, consumers? Because we're talking about uh, farm to fork, but we could look at it the other way around as well, uh, fork to farm. So I could say a lot more about all of this, uh, but uh, I will uh, come back to this later. Thank you very much. Uh, Maud Lelièvre, I would like to... Uh, ask you to react to what uh, Monsieur Brun just said. Do you think that consumers are uh, ready to pay a, a price that is uh, always higher? 
I'm not sure the consumers are ready to do that, but uh, they are more careful about uh, the uh, value chain, about how uh, products are produced in southern countries, about uh, how products are imported uh, by uh, French companies. And uh, I agree with that uh, idea of a third power. I think it will be increasingly the case in the future. I mentioned the example of cotton. So you could have uh, people uh, who uh, have a look uh, at uh, the um, 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 environmental concerns uh, for uh, cotton production, but who will still be ready uh, to uh, buy a T-shirt or a pair of jeans uh, from a um, low-cost retailer. And you talked about uh, uh, local authorities uh, that are part uh, of uh, our uh, uh, network. And uh, one of the main uh, concerns uh, right now uh, is uh, uh, for uh, parents uh, to have uh, vegetarian meals uh, served at school, um, uh, so without uh, any type of uh, animal-based uh, protein. And this is uh, more the case uh, for uh, parents uh, with a, uh, a sustainable uh, economic situation. But I think that it goes uh, well beyond uh, uh, sustainability. At the moment, 83% uh, of uh, French citizens uh, um, feel uh, concerned by uh, the uh, loss uh, of uh, biodiversity. So it doesn't mean that they are ready to act on this, uh, but uh, it gives us an idea uh, of uh, the concerns and the expectations. So uh, I don't know if you talked about a third power, but in any case, that power uh, will be quite uh, important. We can see uh, that consumers are more and more remote uh, from the agricultural world, uh, and uh, there's uh, actually a bigger opposition uh, between uh, extreme views. So it's increasingly difficult to manage in terms of policies. Um, Mathieu Brun, um, uh, maybe I'll be the devil's advocate, but uh, what, what do you think about this as well for consumers? Well, uh, we could uh, think of uh, uh, turning the systems upside down. But uh, um, farmers will uh, produce it because there's a demand. So uh, if we're talking about sustainable supply, well, it needs it to be profitable. So uh, we uh, need to have a market uh, supporting uh, farmers, uh, for instance, uh, for uh, pulses in France, uh, uh, we need uh, to have an industry, uh, we need to have a market uh, uh, to support this production. And this is particularly important. Uh, and I find your question quite interesting. If we uh, reflect uh, on the power of consumers and uh, their willingness uh, to pay more uh, for food, so um, we uh, talk uh, more and more about uh, climate action, uh, for companies and for governments. Uh, and so in 10 or 15 years, uh, uh, will we uh, accuse uh, France uh, or the EU uh, for uh, their uh, decisions and when we can no longer produce our own food and when our partners are no longer uh, ready uh, to uh, meet uh, our demand? Uh, and uh, so uh, is it uh, the responsibility of the state to uh, um, take a part uh, of that uh, increasing price of uh, food products? So that's an interesting question. Yes, well, thank you very much uh, for this uh, answer. So, Mr. Brun, you said before that uh, we need to remain open in a world that is uh, closing down. So do you think that, uh, uh, Mr. Pusha Dalisak, do you think that uh, this world is becoming increasingly complicated and we need to remain open? Well, if you'll allow me, I'm not sure that the world is closing down on itself or that uh, the European Union is. Do you think that we are opening up? Yes, I think we are opening up because... Uh, the EU is uh, seeing itself as being self-sufficient. Uh, we have all of our rules and regulations. Uh, with that, uh, wondering if uh, this is sustainable in the long term, because we live in a globalized world. So I, I think it's m it's uh, this it's more of a self-sufficient vision rather than uh, a matter of uh, being uh, closed to the world. Thank you very much for sharing with us. We are starting to have a few questions. There is one question 
uh, one person at least who would like to talk about mirror clauses versus the uh, uh, carbon mechanism at the border. Who would like to answer this question? Yes, go ahead. So regarding the border carbon, uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, if we want to be um, in a good position standard-wise, we have to protect our industries, whether um, it be in the secondary sector or the primary sector, such as the, the agricultural sector. We need to protect our industries, which will not solve our uh, problems uh, from an exportation point of view. Because if we have, uh, you know, we are, uh, the EU is a great exporter and needs to uh, be more competitive and not only more ethical. And there's no specific scheme to help virtuous uh, companies be competitive from an export point of view. So it won't solve this problem. Now, to go back to agriculture, the carbon border adjustment mechanism will not be applied to agriculture. However, it will be applied to another uh, element that we do use in the agricultural field, and that is the fertilizer sector. And it's a fantastic lack of competitivity we're going to create in the EU. Not only do we have a tax that protects the European industry from uh, nitrogen uh, fertilizers, whether urea or ammonia nitrate, which already exists, but on top of that, we're going to create another problem. So our production costs are going to increase a lot. And there's an inconsistency from the commission here. When you ask the DG environment, uh, they tell you no agriculture will be excluded and uh, fertilizers will be taxed by the carbon border adjustment mechanism. But how much does it cost, we ask? Oh, well, we don't know at the DG environment. You have to ask the DG climate. So. Very often, you know, we complain about France because ministries work in silos. But, uh, you know, amongst the uh, EU commissioners, there should be more consistency. And this is a very serious uh, uh, issue because we cannot drive Europe if we have so many inconsistencies. You seem to be smiling. No, I, I simply completely can completely imagine what he's talking about, I, I see. Uh, do we have any questions in the audience, maybe? Anyone in the audience attending uh, has a question? Any questions for our speakers of the roundtable on uh, standards? Yes, there's a gentleman over there. Please introduce yourself briefly. Xavier Le Prince, I represent uh, the Catholic University at Lille, uh, an engineering school. Now, regarding standards, of course, when it comes to innovation, and I see Mathieu went to our schools recently, he could answer this question. We must uh, train uh, agronomists and engineers. It takes five years to train an engineer. Now, I'd like to know, according to him, what is his priority uh, today when it comes to innovation that is really key today, but also disruptive innovation, especially vertical farms or cell co uh, crops uh, so as to have uh, animal proteins instead of uh, vegetable proteins instead of uh, animal proteins. So. I'd like to know, in your opinion, how must our universities promote innovation and in which field? Mathieu Brun, you have the floor. Yes, that question was directly addressed to me indeed. Thank you for this question. Uh, of course, uh, um, I'm invited to talk about your uh, school and uh, the uh, engineering school also. Uh, that uh, gathers uh, different disciplines. I think it's by decompartmentalizing everything that we will find a solution. Uh, when it comes to innovation, whatever the sector, 
whatever the school, we need to decompartmentalize. And it's something we are trying to do uh, at the uh, Demeter Club and something you do very well also at the Catholic University at, uh, in Lille. We worked with our members, uh, part of our members are here in the room, and, and your skills of the future, uh, they don't exist yet. The needs of the future don't exist yet because every day, every year, we are faced with new needs, new requests. So we need to cultivate this cross-disciplinarity and this capacity to adapt. And I think that if we have more contact between different schools, uh, we will have a better capacity to act. Earlier, we were talking about how important it was to train people on the environment. Uh, all training sessions have the word environment uh, in their titles, and this is very good. It, it also answers uh, the expectations of, of the youngsters. But we shouldn't uh, mix everything. We shouldn't have, on the one hand, the generation that wants a deep transformation, and on the other hand, the Zuckerberg uh, uh, generation or uh, digital transformation, both can be linked. And uh, the African continent actually has many innovation schemes and really wants to find solutions to this issue. And it's, it's really key. Now, uh, disruptive innovations that you mentioned, I think we have to keep focused on markets, sectors, consumers. Uh, it always comes back to the same thing, and also environmental impact of all the different new modes of consumption. What consumers want today, and the lockdown uh, showed this when we analyzed uh, receipts, uh, they want to be reconnected to their own production. So that's why cell uh, farming is, uh, is a big topic today. Thank you very much, Mathieu Brun, for your answers. Uh, we are going to take an online question in a minute. We have a gentleman here in the room who wishes to ask a question first. I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you very much. I uh, represent uh, Portuguese farmers, and uh, I'll speak in English. They will sell cars. They will sell um, services, they will sell ships, I don't know, innovation, mm -hmm. but they want us to go with him to do what? To make the, the agriculture again as a, as a way of, uh, of, of exchange for the, for, for the trade. And the question I leave is, this is not a kind of hypocrisy, what we are doing in the European Union, regulation, 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 and in the end, it's the farmers paying. Thank you. Who wishes to answer that question? Uh, I'll start, and then my colleagues can uh, can uh, compliment. You don't mind if we answer in French, right? That's wonderful. All Portuguese friends uh, are comfortable in every language. I wish I was comfortable in Portuguese. So do I, says uh, the moderator. So if I understood your question correctly, uh, you, you are asking about consistency. Can we sacrifice uh, agriculture? And the Mercosur deba debate is a, a good example of that, uh, to sell more cars or more uh, uh, manufactured goods or industrial goods. I think that the, the question is key. We've been talking about this for several years in terms of consistency in our uh, commitments and public policies. Um, will we only produce everything on site in 10 years from now and sacrifice our uh, agriculture at international level and maybe also accept that what comes into our territory is of uh, lower quality than what comes out? And this is a real uh, key challenge here also in terms of political and geopolitical terms. There's always this rivalry and, and conflict. We mentioned the mirror clauses earlier. I think that there is a key element here that has to do with uh, a retaliation uh, that our partners uh, 
will be able to, to do. Uh, we saw this with Boeing. Uh, there are sacrifices here that will be made. So we need a holistic and systemic approach and not uh, have one type of production uh, that is detrimental to another type of production because agricultural production and farming are really at the basis of our lives. And we have high expectations from our uh, commercial partners also in the Mediterranean, for instance. Does anyone wish to add to what was said? Well, this has always, you know, existed. Uh, now, for Mercosur, we didn't understand why uh, 100,000 tons uh, imported of, of, of meat. Why does the EU need to import so much from Mercosur? Why do we need to import the uh, sugar? while we have an important uh, sugar sector. Why do we need to liberalize the honey market with this uh, chunk of, of, of the, the continent? We didn't understand this. And here we need to be on, a, uh, on the same playing field. You know, when you play basketball, uh, you don't ask uh, French players to uh, play with uh, high heels. Uh, you ask them to wear uh, sneakers or tennis shoes because they need to be efficient. Well, same thing. If you decide to open up the market to a continent because uh, it's important for this continent to be closer to us, while well, we understand the link between Portugal and Spain and, and South America, this link needs to be reinforced, of course, but it needs to happen uh, fairly, and this is not being done, and it's uh, a crazy situation. Dominique Charger mentioned it earlier. One of the problems in Europe is competition amongst ourselves and taxation and social competition also, and it's not a factor that helps us build anything on the contrary. And uh, it's a war price. We need to harmonize all this. If we can do the same in new trade agreements, we need to do this by bringing standards closer to one another. And this is where mirror clauses are key. They're one solution amongst others. Thank you. Yes. I think that this actually reflects the strategic position of agriculture and its importance at global level. We need to find a way to use it as an asset. And whether it be a mirror clause or another solution, we have to be aware not to uh, fall in a bad situation and end up in a situation like Mercosur. So we have to really work on a more global scale it's like a marathon, you know. Uh, we, we need to run a, a marathon instead of uh, um, take a, a speed race. So it takes us back to the same uh, uh, issue. Agriculture really has a big geopolitical uh, stake. Thank you for your answers. We have a an answer we're going to take online before going back to the room. So mirror clauses. We have someone who wants to know how we can make these mirror clauses compatible with international rules of the WTO. Well, before we use mirror clauses, we have other tools. We have safeguard clauses, for instance. We have those in all trade agreements, the EU does not use these safeguard clauses. Those clauses can be used whenever a market is uh, uh, distorted because of imports from a third country. But we don't implement this. DG Trade called me uh, three weeks ago. The commissioner's office uh, reminded me that they had this tool, but they don't want to implement it because, you know, the EU uh, wants to... Uh, showing the image of uh, being peaceful, all friends. So we don't use this clause. Now, mirror clauses 
of course, with all the changes, climate change, etc., we need more globalization to balance the markets because we need competitiveness also. But if this is detrimental to producers and to the minimum autonomy we want to reach in the EU, in that case, you can use mirror clauses and close up the market. Temporary, of course, not uh, forever. But we do have that tool. We have these tools. We don't use them. So whether it be sugar, poultry, uh, or uh, cow meat, this is fundamental. There's a new tool we're going to use. It's on imported deforestation. Uh, all products coming from uh, deforested uh, soils will be subject to uh, a, a new uh, rule. And all the European operators who are going to import lumber uh, and uh, meat, because those will be the first two products we import, soy, cocoa, uh, coffee, will um, come by it later. So for these three sectors, uh, industrials will need to show that they uh, are 100 percent compliant. This is going to be very complicated. So very briefly, uh, um, Mathieu, very briefly, I don't know, but I'll try. I'm sure you'll manage. Uh, I don't want to go into technical details because I'm not competent for that, but uh, we are seeing a globalization and and movement and we are less united. Uh, so before talking about uh, mirror clauses, we, we have standards today that are seen as being a sort of disguised protectionism. And some partners decide to move away from the European market because they have other more interesting markets to go to. So in the future, what will this mean for our uh, uh, products? We will have societal choices, and the EU will have to be convincing. It will have to be a strong uh, political player if it wants to impose its norms, its standards. Uh, very quickly, regarding imported deforestation, we were talking about consumers. Well, this is a subject that was uh, pretty successful in the public consultation. Stations. The second most popular consultation, more than 1.2 contributions were listed. So I think that even though the situation is complicated, there are going to be uh, controversies. Um, and sometimes, you know, you have a decentralized cooperation policy on the one hand, and on the other hand, you decide to close your eyes on the degradation of ecosystems. So. This is inconsistent. Maybe we have to uh, be more rational. And for lumber, wood, for instance, we have to think about the type of uh, consumption we want, uh, try to recycle more, and uh, consume less, because it's going to be more expensive anyway. So on the whole, it will be uh, beneficial, uh, good for the planet. And that's what the uh, IUCN said, that we need to put an end very quickly to deforestation, because we'll need that would, that those forests. Uh, very quickly, to go back to that topic, I also saw the figures. Deforestation has an impact on all of us as citizens, people react. Now, if you look at what's on the table today, Schemes were designed without necessarily knowing what was going on in the field. And we, we, we can have a bilateral talk over this, but I wanted to draw people's attention to the fact that this will not put an end to deforestation. It will simply guarantee that what is imported into Europe is not does not stem from deforestation. There's a nuance here. Yes, it's important also for, for consumers. It, well, you will be able to exchange over lunch. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for this, uh, for your answers. Uh, now we're going to have a question in the room. Uh, yes, gentlemen, you have the floor. Jean-Jacques Hervé, Académie d'Agriculture, and I'm also an expert uh, for Eastern countries. My question is, can we keep 
talking about the environment without including the analysis of production costs and differences in terms of uh, competitiveness. And those gaps are huge at e European level. Who wishes to answer this question? Maybe uh, Arnold Pujdalisak? Well, today, trade is based only on production costs. The uh, idea is to liberalize, to find the lowest price. So that's that was the the goal. But now, taking into account biodiversity, climate change, because we understood that these were key elements if we want our economy to be sustainable and our human species to, you have to take these factors into account. This must also be uh, included in the trade talks. Thank you for the, uh, this answer. And also uh, social conditions under which production is carried out. Thank you. We have an online question by Marie-Pierre Plan. She wants to know the speakers of the roundtable are talking about what should uh, um, change, but what are we doing now to be very concrete? Hard to answer. There's no miracle recipe, you know. At which level? WTO has a dispute settlement system, you know. The Chinese non-liberal economy disrupts uh, the global market. If W and also, you know, you have several uh, issues uh, that need to be solved by a WTO. Uh, you have some countries who, which have become rich, but they. Uh, claim to be developing countries and they don't apply uh, WTO rules and China is an issue also. As long as China is an issue, it's going to be complicated. So what to do? We have another question in the room. Xavier Denot Syngenta. I wanted to go back to what Mrs. Axiotade said. She said uh, we have to train instead of impose and uh, uh, draw a parallel with traceability that we heard of earlier, because we want uh, consumers to think sustainable. But you know, as a consumer, when I go uh, do my my shopping and when I eat at the uh, cafeteria at work, I don't know where my food comes from. I don't know if it's sustainable or not. Uh, so how can we at EU level organize this traceability? How can we organize this information to consumers so that consumers who have the purchasing power for the products uh, he or she buys can, so that the consumers can make an informed uh, uh, decision. There is traceability. Now, sometimes uh, there's a lack of labeling and there's a regulation uh, on that, uh, consumer information, 2018, but it's absolutely not enough. There are national initiatives that are making progress on uh, processed food and on uh, gross products also. There's already a, a labeling system, and we're working on uh, this type of, of labeling also for processed uh, food in France. Things are starting to pick up. And uh, consumers will have the tools and the info more and more. And I think we should maybe uh, get more food uh, that comes from um, the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you for your active participation. Thank you for all the people following us online. Uh, we are reaching the conclusion of this roundtable. You all have one minute to give us your, your feeling on the uh, exchanges of view we've been having. Uh, yes, well, this was a fascinating discussion. It's really interesting to have all those different points of views. Um, as a conclusion, uh, I would maybe focus on the fact that uh, within the framework of the EU presidency. You know, we have six months ahead of us that will help us uh, speak out on these uh, topics. So imported agricultural products, this is an important issue we need to uh, deepen. We need the same sanitary, social uh, 
standards for uh, our products. Of course, this uh, will not be solved uh, from one day to the next. Also, it's really Im important to have uh, suspension clauses in the uh, future agreements if international agreements are not complied with. And third, we have a political agenda that's very uh, also full. We have a convention on uh, biological on um, uh, biological diversity. There will be a meeting in China. There will be the Paris Agreement. Uh, so many things around uh, biodiversity and climate change. And all this will have to be included at EU level also. We have uh, a calendar that might help us uh, get some points of views uh, aligned and uh, uh, find solutions to the environmental crisis, which we haven't found yet. Uh, Iliana Akciotadis, I think we have to keep in mind that Europe needs to import products, whether for its local uh, uh, consumption or whether to process the products and, and re-export them afterwards. So let's not forget about this. Then you said something that's uh, quite interesting. You said we might be more ethical, but we won't be more competitive. And I think that within this uh, debate, we had, had a tendency to forget about farmers. If you don't want to lose competitiveness, you need to have the tools as a farmer to be able to produce uh, in line with consumers' expectations and to be able to also face climate change uh, challenges. But I think we said it all. Mathieu Brun. Thank you very much. Two very quick things. First, a reminder the consequences of the strategies that will be implemented will have impacts on our production capacity and on prices also at international scale, hence on the stability of our world. A few years back, and the Nobel Peace Prize was given to the World Food Program. You know, when people are hungry, they move, they, um, uh, they um, rebel and they end up uh, dying. So this is something we have to remember. The second thing uh, is that agriculture is part of the solution. It should not be seen as an economic, environmental, social cost, but as something valuable. And I want to seize this opportunity in collective discussion to say that we need to be uh, consistent and provide a constructive and positive narrative around agriculture. In the future, we will have a hyper-intensive agriculture. Let's not be afraid of the word. And uh, tomorrow's agriculture also will be um, combining lots of different practices and know-how. Thank you very much, uh, Arnold. Uh, yes, I wasn't able to say uh, that I am disappointed in the Commission's uh, strategy because I feel that the Commission has forgotten about uh, the goal and focused on the means only, and that's not the solution. You know, there's no ban that is useful if you don't have a sustainable solution. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us.